We all have dates that are important to each one of us. It might be the day you graduated, the day your child or grandchild was born, your marriage, your wedding date. And you're, the dates that are important to you are probably not the same as they are, that are important to me, but there are two dates that each one of us have that's important to each one of us. And that's the day we were born, the day we die. And we have no control over either one of those. None of us has to be born, and uh, we're all going to die. And as important as those two dates are, the most important thing is what we do between those two dates. We don't have any control over the date of our birth, no control over the date of our death, but we have control over what happens in between those two days. And what we do in between those two days will determine where we spend eternity. And it's really not exactly right to say that we will spend eternity because that implies that it's going to end. Well, eternity, by definition, doesn't end. But for want of a better word, we'll say it determines where we will spend eternity. Look at Luke, the 16th chapter. And we'll begin with verse 19. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. The rich man didn't go to hell because he was rich. There are lots of instances in the Bible of wealthy people who were pleasing to God. Abraham. Joseph, David, Lydia. The rich man went to hell because he didn't care about anybody but himself. And between the dates of his birth and the dates of his death, he provided only for himself. He may very well have been a religious man. He probably went to synagogue on the Sabbath. He probably went to Jerusalem three times a year. He probably offered the sacrifices that he was required to offer under the old law. But he, his focus was himself. Did he see Lazarus there? Of course he did. Lazarus was laid at his gate. He had to have seen him. Did he know Lazarus needed help? Of course he did. But he didn't care. Lazarus didn't go to Abraham's side because he was poor. Lazarus went to Abraham's side because between the dates of his birth, the date of his death, he did what God wanted him to do. Look at Mark 10, begin with verse 17. Mark 10, we'll begin with verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. 
He went away sad because he had great wealth. This was a good man. I can't honestly say that I have tried to please God from the time that I was a boy. I can't honestly say that, but this man was honest. How do I know that? Well, two ways. One, says Jesus loved him. Now, Jesus loves everybody, but he has a special love for those who are trying to serve him. But the second reason I know that this man was honest is because Jesus said, you lack one thing. And that one thing was not that he was a liar. Jesus didn't say, you lack one thing, you're a liar. He said, you lack one thing, you're too self-centered. You love your money. And then he goes on, he went on later to tell his, his disciples that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven. He wasn't saying that it's impossible for a rich man to enter heaven. He was exaggerating to illustrate a point. This man, between the time of his birth and at least between the time that Jesus talked to him, and we assume between the day of his death, was focused on accumulating wealth. Nothing wrong with, with making money. Money is neither good nor evil. It's a, it's a tool. It's a tool that's, that's necessary in our society. But his focus was solely on, on that money. But in contrast, look at Acts 9 and verse 36. Acts 9, verse 36. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which being translated as Dorcas, who was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died, and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, Please come at once. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. I don't know whether Dorcas taught Bible classes. That's not the point, is it? She did what she could. Between the day that she was born and the day that she died, she was doing good. She was helping others. She was looking out for others. She was helping the poor. All of us can do something, can't we? And that's all that God requires of us, is that we do what we can. But between the day of our birth, the day of our death, we need to do what we can. Look at John, the first chapter. John 1, and verse 40. John 1, verse 40. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had to say, had said, and who followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. What do you know about Andrew? Not very much, because I counted, and I there's eight or ten verses or passages in the New Testament that mention Andrew. What do you know about Peter? You know a lot about Peter, don't you? Because there's a lot of passages in the Bible that mention Peter. Peter was one of the greatest, if not the greatest, preacher that the church has ever known. But for every person that Peter converted, Andrew is responsible for at least one more. Why? Because he's the one that brought Peter to Jesus in the first place. 
Andrew was a personal worker. We don't have any of his sermons recorded. I'm sure he did preach some, but we don't have any recorded. We have some of Peter's. We have some of Paul's. But what we know about Andrew was that he was a personal worker. He did what he could between the time that he was born and the time that he died. He was trying to do what God required. Look at Matthew 25. Matthew 25, and we'll begin with verse 41. This is a picture of the judgment day. Matthew 25, begin with verse 41. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing. I'm sorry, I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. He didn't tell them you had to go out, be a great preacher, great Bible teacher. He just told them, look after my people. They didn't do it. These were apparently religious people. Didn't say they weren't. Didn't say they were evil. Just says that they didn't do what they should have done between the time that they were born and the time that they died. I knew a preacher once that um, he was asked to preach a funeral to a man of the community that had died. The man was despised by everybody in the community. The, um, the funeral director went around to the businessmen of the community and appealed to their uh, sense of civil duty to, uh, to act as pallbearers. There were eight people at the funeral, six pallbearers, the funeral director, and Otto. And uh, his sermon was, don't live your life like this man. Live your life so that when you, are, when you die, there will be more than eight people at the funeral. That's kind of sad, isn't it? Between the time he died, uh, was born and the time he died, he didn't do anything to ingratiate himself to anybody in the community. Look at Hebrews 9, verse 27. Hebrews 9, verse 27. Just as man is destined to die once, and after that, face the judgment. We die, and then the judgment. There's no purgatory. There's nothing in between. There's no second chance. What we do now will determine where we are in eternity. That's kind of scary. In Revelation 20, beginning with verse 12. Revelation 20, verse 12. And I saw that this is a picture of the judgment. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done recorded in the book. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. 
if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. We're writing in that book of life, every one of us, today. And we will be judged based on what we do. And the day we're born, they were we die. There's only two destinations. Heaven is described as Abraham's side, a pleasant place. It's the home of all of the heroes of the Bible. Abraham, Joseph, Lydia, Peter, Paul. And there's plenty of room there. In John 14, in verse 2, we're told, wrong John. John 14, verse 2. It says, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may be where I am. He was talking specifically to the apostles, but it applies to us too. There's plenty of room. There's always room for one more. We sing a song, there's room at the cross for you. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. There's no shortage of rooms in heaven. I'm not sure sure that this is talking about heaven or the church, but whether it's the church or whether it's heaven, there's still plenty of room. Not full. It's a place that was built by God. And that's perfect, isn't it? Heaven is a perfect place built by a perfect God. Look again in Revelation. Revelation 7 Revelation 7, we'll begin with verse 13. And one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they, and where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are those who have come out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear. From their eyes. That's heaven. But there's another destination. In Revelation 21, which we've already read, but let's read it again. Revelation 21 and verse 8. But others, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic, arts, the idolaters, and all liars. Notice he didn't say all black liars. He just said all liars. As far as God's concerned, there's lie, a lie is a lie. No difference between what we call white and black lies. Their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. The lake of fire. Burns are among the most painful of injury. And this is described as a fire that never ends. And um, it's eternal. That's kind of scary to me. Matthew 25 and verse 30. Matthew 25. Verse 30. 
and throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Those of us who have children, grandchildren, understand crying. And it's not a pleasant sound, is it? It's, and I think God designed it that way. You can't ignore that baby's crying. It, it, you, you have to do something. You have to respond because it's very, very unpleasant. And yet, hell is described as a place where there's continual crying, gnashing of teeth. Gnashing of teeth probably for more than one reason. One, because it's painful. Two, because you're angry. And um, it's just not a place where you want to be. Mark 9, verse 48, gives us another graphic description of hell. Mark 9, verse, um, verse 4. I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. <sighs> Mark 9, verse 48. Where their worm does not die, and the fire is not quenched. These aren't the nice, cute little earthworms that aerate and fertilize our soil. Uh, we're talking about maggots. So this is a picture of um, decaying flesh, a stench of death. Not a, not a pleasant picture. In Mark 9, just a little bit to the left, in verse 43, Jesus said, If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell. He's not literally telling us to cut off our, our limbs and poke out our eyes. He's making a point. That don't, that we need to avoid hell at every, any cost, every cost. Do whatever we can to avoid going there. Mark 8, verse 36. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? A rhetorical question. Nothing we can give in exchange for our soul. God already owns it, doesn't he? Nothing we can give that God needs. Nothing we have that God needs. So Jesus advises us to avoid hell at all costs. So there's two important dates in our life. The day we were born, the day we die. And we have no control over those. But we have control over what happens between those two dates. And what we do between those two dates will determine our destination when this life is over. God has some requirements for us, and we can't do it yesterday. Yesterday's gone, and we can't do it tomorrow. Tomorrow never comes, and we're not guaranteed any time except right now. We don't know whether we'll make it home alive, but we do have right now. God requires us to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, John 8, verse 24. He requires us to repent of our sins, Acts 18, verse 30. And repent means not just to change your life. People can change their lives without repenting. Repentance means being sorry for what you've done, 
and decide that you're going to bring your life into compliance with God's requirements. He, requi he requires that we confess that we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Acts, I'm sorry, Romans 10, verse 10. And finally, he requires that we be baptized to have our sins forgiven, Acts 2.38. For those of us who've already done that, we're going to mess up too. John tells us in John 1 that anybody that's, and he's writing to Christians, that anyone who says they don't sin is a liar, and he calls God a liar. So anybody that says they don't sin just did. So what do we do? We don't have to be baptized again. And I, in Acts, the 8th chapter, when uh, Simon the sorcerer, who believed and was baptized and had his sins forgiven, he messed up, and Peter told him to repent and pray and ask God for forgiveness. So, if we can help you in your relationship with God, whether you need to be baptized to have your sins forgiven, whether you need prayers of the church, let us know while we stand and sing.